My apologies to all of the introverts who just died a little bit inside uh, with, that, with that exercise. Well, hey, uh, you know, this is the last time that I get to speak out of the Gospel of John, which means it's the last time I get to do a shameless plug for the Radiant Institute, School of Discipleship. Uh, our application deadline is next Sunday, and we are having one more informational meeting right here, down front, uh, after service. So if this is something you've been like, ah, I have some questions about this, or I'm curious, I just want to learn a little more, or I just, I want this guy to stop talking about this, so I'm going to go to his stupid meeting uh, right after <laughs> Right after service, we'll meet right down front, uh, right here. That QR code on there will take you to the application if you already know that you're interested and want to apply. Speaking of QR codes, uh, we're going to be in John 17 today, so you can, you can start to turn there in your text. The title of today's message is, How Do You Know If You're Sanctified? Uh, and there's a QR code on the screen here, and this wasn't my idea. So if you love this, uh, you just need to turn to your neighbor and say, Joel is awesome. Uh, this QR code will actually take you to uh, my entire slideshow. So you don't have to worry mid-service about trying to take, oh, like that was, that seems important, I should take a picture. You don't have to do any of that. You can get it all right now. If you're like, oh, my phone can't zoom in or whatever, have somebody in front of you do it. It sounds like they had to do that earlier. So like they can scan the QR code. And then on my slideshow is a slide that has a QR code to access my slideshow. It's like those kids' books where they're holding the book that you're reading and then there's a cover with the picture of them holding the book and it just goes on forever. But with QR codes and John 17 message slides. So there you go. If that's helpful, sweet. Here's the only thing I ask. Please don't like zip ahead and just read all of my slides and be like, I'm gonna go look up Olympic scores now. Like, just uh, stay, stay with me, right? Take notes, however you would normally engage a message. But now you have access to this later for your study purposes. Again, not my idea. I can't take credit. So if it works, uh, don't, don't thank me. Uh, but I just, I don't I kind of like the idea. So we're going with it. In John 17, we have uh, the entire chapter is a prayer that Jesus prays. In John 16, which hopefully you had the uh, chance to uh, get into this past week, you saw that Jesus continued to have a conversation with his disciples in this upper room discourse, right? As he's preparing to go to the cross, he's talking to his disciples. John 16, he talks about uh, what Holy Spirit will do when he comes. Uh, he, he gives his disciples the great encouragement of, in this world you will have trouble, that's, you know, one of those verses we all like to hang on to and celebrate. Uh, but he says, hey, don't worry, because I, I overcame the world. So it's, it's cool. It's good. Uh, and then he switches gears. He transitions from, from talking to his disciples to praying. And, and the entire chapter is a prayer, and we're going to dig into that. I'm going to suggest to you that you see a little bit of a structure uh, that Jesus utilizes here. And, and it's right here. Now, I could be wrong, right? So I hope, and I've said this before from this stage, I hope you never just take our word for it. With Pastor Brandon or Pastor Ryan or myself, when we get up here and we say something, don't just take our word for it. Go to the text. In Acts 17, the, the people called the Bereans were commended because they tested everything that they were taught to see if it lined up with scriptures. Now, we don't come up here and intentionally try to, to, to preach things that are incorrect, but don't take our word for it. Don't take our word for it. Go to the scriptures, study them, test it to see if what we're telling you is true. But I'm gonna suggest to you that the, the kind of the structure of the, of the prayer here is we have this idea of, of glorifying. And then Jesus talks about protection. He talks about sanctification. Then he talks about unity. And then he comes back, circles around to the idea of glory. So we're going to journey together through this. Maybe you come up with a different way to break it down. Sweet. Uh, you can show me that after the service. Just don't, like, cheat and go ahead in my slides so you know everything. Okay. All right. So John 17, verse 1, says this. Jesus spoke these things, referring to this conversation that he's been having in the last couple of chapters with his disciples. He spoke those things, looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. Since you gave him authority over all people so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have 
given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. Let's pause for just a second. Jesus tells us something really important here. He tells us the nature of eternal life. Sometimes when you and I, when we talk about eternal life, we, we, we bring to mind, we think, oh, like heaven, it's gonna be so great. And, and I would be really curious to sit down with, with any of you and just pick your brain on like, hey, what do you think heaven is gonna be like? I'm curious how many of us populate heaven with things based on our preferences. I tease, I tease one of our, uh, one of our <laughs> I won't say who it is. I tease a, a friend, a friend, because we did this exercise one time and his version of heaven had a chocolate cake tree. And I was like, <laughs> it's like, first of all, if there's a cake tree in heaven, it's got like New York style cheesecake, not chocolate cake. <laughs> Let's just <laughs> quit that heresy, brother. Let's, no. <laughs> but, but, here's the thing. In, in the conversation with a group of people, like there was this theme and most of us crafted heaven after the things that we think would be really fun or really cool. Now, scripture doesn't give us a ton of detail about what eternal life will look like from a, like a day to day. But I think oftentimes we base it around us when what Jesus tells us, the essence of eternal life is that we would know God. Eternal life is that place of deep, rich communion with the Father and with the Son with the Spirit, we will know him. Paul later tells us that we'll know him in, in fullness. Right, right now we see partially. Oh, but then we're gonna see and it's gonna be clear and it's gonna be rich and vibrant. He says, that is eternal life. He says, I have glorified you. Jesus is speaking to the Father. I've glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. This is a theme that John has hit on a couple of times. Again, go back to the very beginning. Right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was there in the beginning. He was there before all things were created. And Jesus is acknowledging that same thing here. I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, because I have given them the words you gave me. They have received them and have known for certain that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. So now we see a shift in the prayer of Jesus. He now says, I pray for them, referring to his disciples. And I would suggest that this uh, actually extends to us as well. He says, I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me because they are yours. Everything I have is yours, and everything you have is mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name, the name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your names that you have given me. I guarded them and not one of them is lost except the son of destruction, which is a reference to Judas, so that the scripture may be fulfilled. If you go back to that, that uh, second or third slide where we see that summary, again, he's, he's now in that, that prayer for protection which if you actually look at the, the Lord's Prayer uh, that we see in Matthew and, and in Luke, right? Like Jesus is actually using a, a very similar structure uh, that, uh, that he taught his disciples. He actually utilizes the same structure. But he says, Lord, I, I protected them, but I'm, I'm not gonna be hanging out a whole lot longer. He says, now I'm coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy completed in them. I have given them your word, the world hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Now this, I think, is important. He says, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I think sometimes uh, within our faith, we make the mistake of, of creating these holy huddles, 
right? Uh, kind of like the, you know, the frozen chosen, whatever you're, you know, whatever you want to call it, right? But, but where we just kind of, we, we pull away, we disengage from the world. But Jesus says, no, 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 hey, because let's be real, Jesus could have prayed, hey, Lord, give them a really cool tree fort somewhere to where nobody in the world can ever bother them and just, they can just exist in, in, in peace and quiet. But you know, he's, he specifically says, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world. Well, they're going to stay there. Even though that's not the agenda that they're aligned with, they're going to stay there, so I'm going to ask you to protect them. He says, don't take them out of the world. Protect them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. This is that, that sanctification piece. Uh, this is a, our, our little Greek lesson for the day. Everybody say hagiadzo. Hagia, say it with a little bit more conviction. Hagiadzo. There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're like a little like, like a you know, samurai vibe there, Jacob. I like that. I like that. <laughs> he just made it even cooler than the Greek did. This is, uh, this just means to sanctify, to make holy. Or it's this, it's this, this process. Uh, that's that, that Greek word. Did you know you're going to get to speak Greek today? Now, if somebody comes up to you later today and says, man, have you spoken any Greek today? You could say, yes, I have. <laughs> and if you're Jacob, you can say that you said it like a samurai warrior. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, let's bounce back to John 14. John 14, you don't have to turn there, right? It's just, just the one verse. But he says this, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. So we're, we're, we're bouncing back in this conversation. So he says, hey, sanctify them by the truth. Earlier, when talking about Holy Spirit's work, Jesus says that he's gonna do this. He's gonna teach you all things, remind you of everything that I told you. And then in John 16, which you should have read this past week, says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all what? The truth. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to suggest to you this morning uh, that sanctification is the process of Holy Spirit washing out the lies with the truth. Sanctification is the process of Holy Spirit washing out the lies with the truth. Now, if you're like me, uh, there might be times when the tool that Holy Spirit needs to use is a power washer, right? And, and he's got that little, he's got that nozzle on there to where like you could cut through airplanes with this thing, like, and Holy Spirit's in some crevices in my life, like really, really pounding that out. But this is the process where he says, hey, I'm here to guide you into all truth. You can't be guided into the truth if you're still holding on to some lies. And I'm going to give you just three, three categories, and we could go a billion different directions with this, uh, but we don't have a billion different minutes uh, to do that today. So I want to suggest to you that, that the sanctification process is replacing lies about God, about others, and about you or me. Uh, and sanctification is, is, is replacing all of those things with the truth. Now, in just a, a, a minute here, we're going to... We're going to get into uh, the next theme, which is unity, and I'm going to suggest to you that these things are, are connected. But what are some lies that we can talk about here? Uh, Steve, can I borrow you? Can you come on up here? Jacob, can you come on up here? Samurai warrior, Greek samurai warrior Jacob. All right. Uh, Jacob, I'm going to have you stand right over here. You're going to right over here. Uh, Jacob is going to represent God in this, uh, in this particular illustration. Are you cool with that? Okay, don't let it like, go to your head or anything like that. It's cool. All right. Steve is going to represent other people. I am going to represent uh, Josh Harima. So that's, that's just me. Right. There are lies that we believe in all three of these categories. And, and they can have a, a significant impact on the way that we live. Uh, so Jacob, as, as God here, what are some things I might believe about God that could be a hindrance to me living into the designs of Jesus? Right. I'm tired of your mistakes. Oh, that's good. <laughs> He's you. You're doing. You're doing really good. I'm just gonna give you the mic. <laughs> Jacob's getting deep. He says one of the lies we can say that man. God's probably sick of me screwing this up. He's tired of my mistakes. Right. If I approach God 
believing he's sick of me screwing up. How healthy is this relationship? It's not a true question. How healthy is this? It's not. It's not. Let's go to a fundamental level. What if I believe that, that this isn't even a real thing, right? Like there's nobody there. It's invisible. I don't even believe that there is a God. <laughs> Does that affect my ability to live into his design? Yes. Maybe, maybe I believe that, that God is just, you know, he's just up there ready to, to, to smite me. And as much fun as a good smiting sounds, <laughs> right? If I, if I think he's just, he's ready to, to throw down with me, how, how's this relationship gonna be? If he's tired of my mistakes, if he's ready to smite me, how likely is it that I'm gonna come in and just be fully honest with God? That I'm gonna just, I'm gonna tell him everything. Every struggle that I have, and let's say, let's say a Holy Spirit is in me and he's trying to wash stuff out and he's like, ooh, hey, Josh, here's this lie that you believe. Do I want to even take that to the Father if I think he's up there sick? Like, oh, dang it, like, Josh is believing another lie. I can't believe he fell for that one too. How's this relationship gonna be? So I think Holy Spirit, one of the things he does is he, he has to wash out those lies about, about who God is and how God operates for this to be a healthy relationship. Does this make sense? So Steve represents other people. What are some things that I might believe about other people that could be a hindrance? You know, maybe I look at Steve and I said, man, Steve is like, he's a super spiritual guy. And he is, Steve's awesome, right? Like, man, Steve is so in tune with Holy Spirit. Like Steve just, man, he knows all these things about, you know, the authority we have in Jesus, all these different things. Uh, I don't think I'm very good at that. Uh, what do I do? Steve is so much more spiritual than me. I don't want to hang out with Steve because then I might feel bad about how not spiritual I am compared to Steve. Right? We, we so often buy into this, this performance mindset in our culture that, that our worth is somehow tied to my, my performance, my accomplishments, my abilities. And then it, then it creates competition where there should be, we'll talk about it in a minute here, unity, right? I feel like, you know, Steve's better than me, but I should try to be better so that I can be more like Steve, but also at the same time better than Fred, who's over here, because, I man, I don't want to be as unspiritual as Fred. Oh. And, and we make it a competition, and, and now... This has created a barrier between me and a brother. Right? I mean, you can fill in the blank with whatever you want. Man, I just, I don't read the Bible as much as Steve does. Whew, I'm, I'm really slacking. I don't pray as much as Steve does. Oh, can't believe it. And God's sick of my mistakes. So I don't read the Bible as much as Steve. And Steve reads the Bible a lot. And I bet you God really likes that Steve reads the Bible a lot. And I don't read the Bible a lot. I'm not like Steve. So God must not like me. We laugh, but this is the space that a lot of us live in functionally. Right? The lies that we believe about them affects our ability to engage, to live in unity. Again, we'll talk about that here uh, again just uh, in a minute. Uh, you guys grab a seat. Thank you. Let's, uh... And then there was those lies that we believe about ourselves, And this could be a long, 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 long list. Right? Whether it's, it's connected to that, like, yeah, I'm just, man, I'm not good enough. What is good enough? How much is good enough? Who created that standard? What are we measuring ourselves against? But yet we hold ourselves uh, accountable to this imaginary, non-existent standard, and then we, we dump on ourselves about it. And the enemy leverages that. We, we, we look at the way that we live, we look at the choices that we've made, and we say, man, I just, oh, there's no way that God could love this, right? And, and we buy into all kinds of lies, right? I mean, here's the, here's the reality. Like when it comes to, to whether or not we're good enough, there's beauty in recognizing none of us are good enough 
Jesus is good enough, and that's where I'm gonna, that's where I'm gonna hang out, right? So we gotta let go of some of those, those lies that we believe about ourselves. And we have to replace those with the truth. Last week, Pastor Ryan talked about, he, he mentioned several of these, of these biblical statements about who we are in Christ. Right? And we can say, well, hey, am I gonna, am I gonna listen to this little, little uh, rehearsal in my own brain of who I think I am, of who the people around me think I am, of who I think God thinks I am? even though there's no biblical support for that? You know, or am I gonna look at scripture and say, well, this is what, what God says that I am. This is who he says I am. Am I gonna, am I gonna camp out in that, in that spot? We have, we have a choice. Uh, a while ago, we did this series called The, the Unseen Realm, where we, we looked at uh, three things that kind of work against us as followers of Jesus. You have the devil, which in John 17, Jesus prayed we would have protection from. And we do. The name of Jesus is far greater than anything the enemy can, can do. And Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That's, that's biblical right there. Jesus shows up and kicks the devil in the teeth, right? And, and, but the enemy is like, he's trying to put up a fight. But Jesus says, hey, Father, protect my followers from the devil. And then we have the flesh, right? We have our, our sin nature, uh, and that is where Jesus says, hey, we gotta sanctify that. We gotta, we gotta change that around. We gotta make that holy. We've gotta, we've gotta bring things into alignment with the will and way of the Father. And Holy Spirit works that within us. Again, it's not that we have to just try a little bit harder. Uh, holy Spirit comes in and, and he does that work as we allow him to. And then you have the world, or again, the culture at large that is, is opposed to God. Jesus says that we are spiritually separate. Spiritually separate. Again, he, he could have prayed that we would all be taken out of the world, that things would just be, you know, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. He didn't. He said, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world. I'm praying that you would protect them from the evil one. Even though we're not from here, right? We're not aligned with the world's agenda. We're to align ourselves with the agenda of God. And we can't be taken out of the world because that's kind of where Jesus wants us to be. As we continue that prayer in John 17, verse 18, it says, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. It says Jesus had a mission. He said that he came to seek and save the lost. He extended that same mission to us. Uh, so and we can't do that up in our chocolate cake tree, tree fort thing, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. We are sent out into the world. Jesus continues, I sanctify myself for them so that they may also be sanctified by the truth. There's that idea of sanctification. I need about truth once again. He says, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. So this is, Jesus is praying explicitly for us. Again, I think the, the earlier prayers can be extended to us as well, but this, he is praying explicitly for us. The people that would believe based on what the disciples went and taught. This is, <coughs> Excuse me. This is what Jesus prays for us. May they all be how many? One. One as you father are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. Now, you guys get check this out. You didn't know that you were going to going to get to say one Greek word today. You get to say two. You get to say two. Two Greek words today. All right, I want everybody to say, say heis. Heis. All right, that's a, that's a second Greek word, and this is gonna blow your mind. Heis is a Greek word. We translate it as one, but in the original Greek, that word means one. It means one. And in the event, that's not compelling enough. It means a single unit. Not two or more. One. How many we got? One heist, heist. You said that like a samurai warrior too. Are you actually a samurai? You've got like the goatee and the. You didn't cry. All right. After church, you should like fight Micah Brown. I'm just. I don't know. You probably shouldn't. He'll, dude. He'll kick your butt. Like he will kick your butt. <laughs> 
You're awesome. You're awesome. He'll, he'll clean your clock. All right. So one, one. There's still some sanctifying going on here. Like it's, you know. What Jesus prays for us is that we would be one. So go back to that structure, right? He talks about glorifying the Father, how the glor- Father glorifies him. And then he talks about this protection and, and he wants the, fa- the Father to sanctify. And I would suggest that those two middle components uh, lead to the third one. So I have a question. What if, what if unity is the primary mark of sanctification? What if unity is the primary mark of sanctification? Uh, we are a Wesleyan church, unapologetically, right? We're a Wesleyan church, part of the holiness movement. Unfortunately, some of the things that uh, have gone sideways sometimes in holiness churches, right, is we make it primarily about behavior modification. And we say, well, hey, uh, we know that you're holy if you don't do this list of things. The problem is that list of things can vary from one church to the next. So what's perfectly fine here is going to get you excommunicated up the street, right? I mean, and that, that list changes, and we, we make it just about behavior modification. And sure, there are some behaviors that we should stop doing, right? I'm not saying that we just keep going, right? Now stop doing some of that crap. But sanctification is far more than that. I have a really, I have a really cool, no, no, no. <laughs> I, told, I told the first service, I said, because there are young people in the audience, I can't tell you my, my uncle's joke. But, and I said, ask me after service. Then the only person that came up to me afterwards was like a 17-year-old kid. Like, I still can't tell you the joke. Come on. <laughs> ha. It's a really good joke, though. All right, what if unity? What if unity is the primary mark of sanctification? Not all of these behaviors. Not all these behaviors. Right, we look at people and say, oh, ooh, I can't believe you know, the other day I saw Tim with a cigarette. I thought he was holy, but goodness me. Oh, what? What? And we just, we make it about this list of do's and don'ts. What if? What if? Unity is the primary mark of sanctification. How are we doing? Let's temporarily just forget about all those other things. If this was the only metric... How are we doing? And I say, how are we doing? Because unity is not an individual exercise. <laughs> you can't, I can't go home and hang out by myself and say, you know what? I'm doing a really good job being united. I am like, the, I'm uniting the crap out of this thing. Unity is something that is, is, is us, all of us. So how are we doing? How are we as a, as a local body of the church doing? Both when it comes to this, how are we doing with the other churches proclaiming the name of Jesus? Are we united with the other churches proclaiming the name of Jesus? How are we doing? And what if that's how we can tell if we're actually being sanctified. The problem is sometimes, you know, in church world, we, we look around and go back to that idea of lies or, that we believe about ourselves, about God, about others. Have you ever walked into the room and you look across and you're like, man, I just got to sneak out real quick before that person comes up to me? Have you ever walked into a church service and said, I can't believe they let that person come to church here? And these are actual conversations. I've talked to people that said, I can't believe you let so-and-so in the door. So he's like, what lie is being believed about that other person or about me or about God that's, that's fostering that type of mentality? Jesus continues his prayer. He says, I am in them and you are in me so that they may be made completely, how many? That the world may know you have sent me and have loved them 
as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am so that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. Righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you, and they have known that you sent me. I made your name known to them and will continue to make it known so that the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. So if we go back to our prayer structure, right, we see Jesus, he prays for those that would believe in the, uh, the apostles' message that they would be completely one. And he says, I want them to be completely one so that the world will know that you have sent me. When we get unity right, it is a billboard pointing to Jesus. A billboard pointing to Jesus. I will suggest to you here today that protection, right? He prayed protection from the, the evil one. Sanctification, so you be sanctified them by the truth. And unity are inextricably linked. As we're transformed by the truth, we see Jesus, we see others, and we see ourselves truly. And having that proper perspective dispels disunity. The things that get in the way of, of me being united with Steve, that, that's based on a lie. So if I can get rid of the lie, believe the truth, me and Steve, man, we can be in a place of unity. I can, I can you know, get rid of those lies that I have about God, and now there's, there's unity there. Right? And, and, and when we start to do this on a, on, a, on a broader scale, I think this is where we see that oneness that Jesus was talking about. I suggest to you these things are linked. So go back to the title of the message. How can I know if I'm sanctified? I would suggest to you <laughs> we look at unity. I want to encourage you over the next week. Worship team, you guys can, can make your way up here. Uh, I want to encourage you to spend some time with Holy Spirit and really let him uh, kind of into the room and ask, that, ask and answer this question, what lies, whether it's about, about Jesus, about Holy Spirit, about you know, some other person, about myself, what lies am I believing that prohibit unity? Because again, even those lies I believe about myself, if I, if I am not living into what God has called me to be because of a lie that I am believing, that interferes unity, even though that's just on, on my end, right? Because Paul uses the, the description of, of a body and it's all these parts working together. If I believe a lie and remove myself from the equation, the body is missing a part. So what lies am I believing about Jesus, about others, and or ourself that are prohibiting unity? Another way to look at it, or you know, kind of a, a different way, what, <clears throat> excuse me, what needs to be sanctified in you and in me to promote unity? How do I actually move towards this? So in, over this next week, uh, just create some space. Oh, maybe it's the weeks. You know, I don't know. It's a process. Sanctification takes a while, at least in my case. But what, what needs to be sanctified? What are those lies I need to shut down? Whether it's my own voice, the voice of others, the voice of the enemy. What are the voices I need to shut down? Because all they're speaking is lies. Give Holy Spirit that space to illuminate those things and begin to wash those things out of you. We actually have a whole ministry here at Radiant Life. I don't know if you knew this. We have our, our Radiant Freedom Prayer Ministry. And kind of the core of that is identifying lies that, that maybe you're buying into. Uh, I would encourage you to check it out. It's the second second Wednesday of every month. We do an orientation for that. Um, just for you to check. Maybe that's something you need to, uh, to look into to see what some of those lies might be. I'm going to invite you to stand. I'm going to pray. And then we're, uh, the worship team is going to sing a blessing over all of us. Uh, and as we sing this, right, let's, let's be in that space of unity. Uh, don't, don't just sit and receive the blessing. As you sing it, I, I encourage you to be very intentional, but you're declaring this same blessing over the people around you. 
uh, maybe people that you don't know, maybe people that you don't uh, like <laughs> or get along with, uh, let's, let's pray this blessing over them. Uh, but I'll close the prayer and then uh, the team will lead us in this last song. Father God, thank you for the truth of who you are. Thank you for revealing yourself in Jesus. Holy Spirit, thank you for reminding us of all those things. Holy Spirit, thank you for the transformational work you do in our lives. Father, I do pray for each and every one here, each and every one join us online. I just pray in the name of Jesus, your protection over them from the lies of the enemy. Shut their ears, Lord, to the things the enemy tries to work against them. Any, any spiritual forces coming at them, we, we cancel those missions. In the name and blood of Jesus. Father God, may we, may we be washed in the word, washed in the truth of what you say about us. And Lord, may we come together in such unity that people see you undeniably. We pray that in the matchless name of Jesus, amen.